Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is The Quest of the Queen's Tears by Lord Dunsany. This story comes from Dunsany's Book of Wonder, first published in 1918. As we might expect, this story merges a kind of standard fairy tale format with Dunsany's weird world building and short, twisted endings. Now, let's open our imaginations and begin. Sylvia, queen of the woods in her woodland palace, held a court and made a mockery of her suitors. She would sing to them, she said. She would give them banquets. She would tell them tales of legendary days. Her jugglers should caper before them. Her armies salute them. Her fools crack jests with them and make whimsical quips. Only she could not love them. This was not the way, they said, to treat princes in their splendor and mysterious troubadours concealing kingly names. It was not in accordance with fable. Myth had no precedent for it. She should have thrown her glove, they said, into some lion's den. She should have asked for a score of venomous heads of the serpents of Lycantara, or demand the death of any notable dragon, or sent them all upon some deadly quest, but that she could not love them. It was unheard of. It had no parallel in the annals of romance. And then she said that if they must needs have a quest, she would offer her hand to him who first should move her to tears and the quest should be called, for reference in histories or song, the quest of the queen's tears, and he that achieved them she would wed, be he only a petty duke of lands unknown to romance. And many were moved to anger, for they hoped for some bloody quest, but the old lord's chamberlain said, as they muttered amongst themselves in a far, dark end of the chamber, that the quest was hard and wise, for that if she could ever weep, she might also love. They had known her all her childhood. She had never sighed. Many men had she seen, suitors and courtiers, and had never turned her head after one went by. Her beauty was as still sunsets of bitter evenings when all the world is for a wonder and a chill. She was as a sun-stricken mountain uplifted alone, all beautiful with ice, a desolate and lonely radiance late at evening, far up beyond the comfortable world, not quite to be companioned by the stars, the doom of the mountaineer. If she could weep, they said, she could love, they said. And she smiled pleasantly on these ardent princes and troubadours concealing kingly names. Then one by one they told, each suitor prince, the story of his love, with outstretched hands and kneeling on the knee, and very sorry and pitiful were the tales, so that often up in the gallery some maid of the palace wept, and very graciously she nodded her head, like a listless magnolia in the deeps of the night, moving idly to all the breezes its glorious bloom. And when the princes had told their desperate loves and had departed away with no other spoil than that of their own tears only, even then there came the unknown troubadours and told their tales in song, concealing their gracious names. And one there was, a Cronian, clothed with rags, on which was the dust of roads, and underneath the rags was war-scarred armor, whereon were the dints of blows, and when he stroked his harp and sang his song, in gallery above gallery, maidens wept, and even the old lord's chamberlain whimpered among themselves, and thereafter laughed through their tears, and said, It is easy to make old people weep, and to bring idle tears from lazy girls, but he will not set a weeping the queen of the woods. And graciously she nodded, and he was the last. And disconsolate went away those dukes and princes and troubadours in disguise. Yet Oconion pondered as he went away. King was he of Afarma, Lul, and Half, overlord of Zerura and Hilly Cheng, and duke of the dukedoms of Mulong and Malash, none of them unfamiliar with romance or unknown or overlooked in the making of myth. He pondered as he went in his thin disguise. Now, 
by those that do not remember their childhood having other things to do be it understood that underneath fairyland which is as all men know at the edge of the world there dwelleth the gladsome beast a synonym he for joy it is known how the lark in its zenith, children at play out of doors, good witches and jolly old parents have all been compared, and how aptly with this very same gladsome beast. Only one crab he has, if I may use slang for a moment to make myself perfectly clear, only one drawback, and that is that in the gladness of his heart he spoils the cabbages of the old man who looks after fairyland, and of course he eats men. It must further be understood that whoever may obtain the tears of the gladsome beast in a bowl and become drunken upon them may move all persons to shed tears of joy so long as he remains inspired by the potion to sing or to make music. Now, a cronion pondered in this wise that if he could obtain the tears of the gladsome beast by means of his art, withholding him from violence by the spell of music, and if a friend should slay the gladsome beast before his weeping ceased, for an end must come to weeping, even with men, so that he might get safe away with the tears, and drink them before the queen of the woods, and move her to tears of joy. He sought out, therefore, a humble knightly man who cared not for the beauty of Sylvia, queen of the woods, but had found a woodland maiden of his own once long ago in summer. And the man's name was Arath, a subject of Acronion, a knight at arms of the spear guard, and together they set out through the fields of fable until they came to Fairyland, a kingdom sunning itself, as all men know, for leagues along the edges of the world. And by a strange old pathway they came to the land they sought, through a wind blowing up the pathway sheer from space with a kind of metallic taste from the roving stars. Even so they came to the windy house of Thatch, where dwells the old man who looks after fairyland, sitting by parlor windows that look away from the world. He made them welcome in his starward parlor, telling them tales of space, and when they named to him their perilous quest, he said it would be a charity to kill the gladsome beast, for he was clearly one of those that liked not its happy ways. And then he took them out through his back door, for the front door had no pathway or even a step. From it the old man used to empty his slops sheer onto the southern cross, and so they came to the garden wherein his cabbages were, and those flowers that only blow in fairyland, turning their faces always toward the comet, and he pointed them out the way to the place he called Underneath, where the gladsome beast had his lair. Then they maneuvered. Acronion was to go by the way of the steps with his harp and an agate bowl, while Arath went around by a crag on the other side. Then the old man who looks after fairyland went back to his windy house, muttering angrily as he passed his cabbages, for he did not love the ways of the gladsome beast, and the two friends parted on their separate ways. Nothing perceived them but that ominous crow glutted over long already upon the flesh of man. The wind blew bleak from the stars. At first there was dangerous climbing, and then Acronion gained the smooth, broad steps that led from the edge to the lair, and at that moment heard at the top of the steps the <laughs> continuous chuckles of the gladsome beast. He feared then that its mirth might be insuperable, not to be saddened by the most grievous song. Nevertheless, he did not turn back then, but softly climbed the stairs, and, placing the agate bowl upon a step, struck up the chaunt called Dolorous. It told of desolate, regretted things befallen happy cities long since in the prime of the world. It told of how the gods and beasts and men had long ago loved beautiful companions, and long ago in vain. It told of the golden host of happy hopes, but not of their achieving. It told how love scorned death, but told of death's laughter. The contented chuckles of the gladsome beast suddenly ceased in his lair. He rose and shook himself. He was still unhappy. A cronion still sang on the chant called Dolorous. The gladsome beast came mournfully up to him. Acronion ceased not for the sake of his panic, but still sang on. 
He sang of the malignity of time. Two tears welled large in the eyes of the gladsome beast. A cronion moved the agate bull to a suitable spot with his foot. He sang of autumn and of passing away. Then the beast wept as the four hills weep in the thaw, and the tears splashed big into the agate bowl. A cronion desperately chanted on. He told of the glad, unnoticed things men see and do not see again, of sunlight beheld unheeded on faces now withered away. The bowl was full. A cronion was desperate. The beast was so close. Once he thought that its mouth was watering, but it was only the tears that had run onto the lips of the beast. He felt as a morsel. The beast was ceasing to weep. He sang of worlds that had disappointed the gods, and all of a sudden, crash! And the staunch spear of a wrath went home behind the shoulder, and the tears and the joyful ways of the gladsome beast were ended and over forever. And carefully they carried the bowl of tears away, leaving the body of the gladsome beast as a change of diet for the ominous crow. And going by the windy house of Thatch, they said farewell to the old man who looks after Fairyland, who, when he heard of the deed, rubbed his large hands together and mumbled again and again, and a very good thing, too. My cabbages, my cabbages. And not long after, a cronion sang again in the sylvan palace of the Queen of the Woods, having first drunk all the tears in his agate bowl. And it was a gala night, and all the court were there, and ambassadors from the lands of legend and myth, and even some from terra cognita. And a cronion sang as he never sang before, and will not sing again. Oh, but dolorous, dolorous are all the ways of men. Few and fierce are his days, and the end trouble, and vain, vain his endeavor. And woman, who shall tell of it? Her doom is written with man's, by listless, careless gods with their faces to other spheres. Somewhat thus he began, and then inspiration seized him, and all the trouble and the beauty of his song may not be set down by me. There was much gladness in it, and all mingled with grief. It was like the way of man. It was like our destiny. Sobs arose at his song. Sighs came back along echoes. Seneschals, soldiers, sobbed, and a clear cry made the maidens. Like rain, the tears came down from gallery to gallery. All around the woods was a storm of sobbing and sorrow. But no, she would not weep. The best sentence in this story is, And very graciously she nodded her head, like a listless magnolia in the deeps of the night, moving idly to all the breezes its glorious bloom. It's a wonderful depiction of the beauty and indifference of the queen. I didn't want him to kill the gladsome beast. I liked the gladsome beast. And all for nothing, because the queen didn't cry in the end anyway. The gladsome beast cried. And yes, I'm mad about it. But that huge detail aside, there are other interesting aspects of this story. The whole thing started because the queen did not and would not love any of her suitors. And she said, she's going to, I will host you and I'll entertain you, but I'm not going to love you. Then everybody gets upset. And so in order to please them, she made up this quest knowing that it wouldn't work and she wouldn't cry any more than she would love. This poor woman is a modern, practical monarch trapped in a fairy tale world where everybody insists on epic adventures and high romance, and so she has to kind of go along with it. I also thought it was interesting that the tears of the gladsome beast were supposed to inspire the songs that would make the queen cry tears of joy. That seems very poetic and appropriate to me, and it's a bit disappointing that it didn't happen. Please excuse the unending motorcycles this evening. Anyway, do you think that perhaps a cronion got it wrong and he should have been singing happy songs at the end instead of sad ones? So here's the part where I mentioned that I have previously recorded three stories by Lord Dunsany on the channel and I have been mispronouncing his name the entire time. 
I am so grateful for the commenter who corrected me and I'm kind of annoyed with myself. You know, I did all this research on his life and his work and I learned all about him and I never bothered to double check the pronunciation of his name. <sighs> anyway, if you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. Tonight's confession is that I can't think of what to say. I'm recording a bunch of videos in a row so I can get ahead of schedule for my trip to Denmark this month. So I've just done a bunch of confessions in a row and now I have no more confessions on the top of my mind. I'm excited to go to Denmark. I've been lucky enough to visit several times in recent years and it's such a really nice place to be. There's a lot of creativity and progress and innovation, but somehow it still has a kind of chill energy. In the U.S., I feel like that kind of industriousness has to be coupled with ambition and competitiveness, but the Nordics just don't seem to work like that. So you can have cool, interesting work and successful projects and forward motion and a great career, along with long holidays and relaxing evenings and a good quality of life. For me personally, it's amazing how quickly I dropped that kind of competitive, edgy career focus that I had honed for so many years living in the States. I want to relax now and have time to enjoy things and think about them and pay attention to myself and my surroundings. And of course, I think the pandemic played a big role in how I'm thinking about life and what to do with my future. It actually probably plays a bigger role in my decisions about this channel than I really appreciate. If you like to listen to stories and learn odd facts and ponder the meaning of work and life, you should subscribe to this channel. At Restored Lore, I find old, weird, and interesting stories from around the world, and I bring you a new one twice a week. Please also, if you would, drop a like on this video and maybe a comment below. It really does help the channel grow. Thank you so much for your support, and I will see you in a few days.